and welcome to Mastering Online Meetings. I'm your host, Chris Templeton. Thank you for joining us. We are here with uh, Mike Fradenberg, the author of Mastering Online Meetings. And I just want to get a couple of house cleaning items out of the way. First of all, because we respect your time, we're going to keep it tight to half an hour. You'll all be muted and are muted throughout the meeting. However, you can ask questions. There's a chat function that you can use and feel free to ask questions that way. And if we have time, we'll go through and get to those questions. If not, we'll go ahead and uh, answer them in a follow-up to you. What I want to do at this point is introduce Mr. Mike Fradenberg. Mike is the owner of the Cooperation Company, a firm that helps people find ways to collaborate which is always a good thing. Uh, I would also, he's also been facilitating meetings for more than 40 years and teaching facilitation skills for the last 20 years. He's now focusing on how to make online meetings work better, including just publishing his new book, Mastering Online Meetings, a book of tips that anyone can use to improve their meetings. I want to welcome Mr. Mike Fradenberg. Welcome, Mike. Happy to be here. Thanks for very much for help setting this up. So I'm looking forward to a good half hour where we spend the bulk of our time just sharing ideas about how people can make their meetings work better. It's such an important thing. Let's talk a little bit about putting this book together. What's been the biggest lesson that you learned about mastering online meetings? Yeah, just from my own experience, trying to make those meetings work, plus talking to the many people that are in my training workshops about their frustrations running these meetings, I think the largest uh, and most surprising lesson I learned is that online meetings are more difficult than in-person or face-to-face -face meetings to run. And there's a lot of good reasons for that, but it's just a surprise that people are frustrated about their online meetings when, in fact, there's really good reasons why they're more difficult to run. So talk about some of those reasons and, and what they are and what, what you can do as somebody who's leading a meeting or even in a meeting to make those be more effective. There, there's a lot of commonality and in, in analysis about why meetings in the online enver environment are more difficult. There are those uh, problems like you can't read the room. If you're a inside a meeting room in a face-to-face -face meeting, you can look at body language, you can look at how engaged people are you can sort of read visual cues that tell you what's going on. Well, you put this artificial barrier of uh, uh, even a screen, like I, I can look, turn my eyes from the camera and look at you on screen. I can see you had it nodding your head. I can do a few things like that, but I still can't read really how fully engaged you are. So there's a separation there that makes it somewhat difficult. There's also just limitations of the medium. It's really hard to do simultaneous activities in an online environment. In a face-to-face -face meeting, you can have people doing multiple things at one time. You can have task groups doing things. You can have people um, going to different places in the room and writing, writing material on different pieces of flip chart paper. You can do things like that to make it, not only time efficiencies, but to spark people's creativity. In an online environment, it's pretty much a linear process. You just got to take it one step at a time. There are some things you can do about it, but the limitations of the medium, medium um, make it more difficult to have those meetings be uh, really successful. And it's hard to, uh, in an online environment, to uh, harness the peer-to-peer -peer expectations that people have of one another. If you're in a face-to-face -face meeting and, and you're tripped out and not paying attention, it's real apparent to all your peers in the room. And so there's a bit of social pressure there to, to be present, be in the meeting, and, and try, to, try to make your own contributions. In an online environment, that's more obscure. And so people can be taking notes or they can turn their cameras off even. Uh, even mute their microphones. They can do multitasking, all of those sorts of things. So there's some issues there about the social interactions that uh, make online meetings more difficult as well. So when you look at those issues, and really it's a question of engagement, isn't it? How do I keep people engaged in the meeting? What are some of the things that you can do to help people stay engaged and not be distracted, not go and multitask and that sort of thing? Yeah, there are some good things you, you can do. First and foremost, what you can do is you can set expectations first with yourself. So as the person who's leading the meeting, my encouragement is don't beat yourself up if you find these, these are hard meetings to run because, in fact, they are hard. So set expectations for it's a reasonable productivity. 
you can be just a dynamite facilitator in an in-person meeting and be frustrated because you can't achieve that same level of success. So set expectations first with yourself. Second, set expectations with the people in the meeting and especially the person who's sponsoring the meeting. Because in fact, if you don't convey to them that these meetings are less productive than face-to-face -face meetings, they're going to make an assumption that you can be as effective as you normally are. And so you want to be careful not to set up a situation where people are, are disappointed. Clarifying those expectations going in is really, really helpful for everybody involved. And then uh, there's no substitute for what I call close and active facilitation. You want to be on top of all the events in the meeting a little bit more than you are in a face-to-face -face meeting because you have to be monitoring the implementation of a single activity and then making judgments, did it work or not work, so you can do some adjustments and move forward. In an online meeting, it really is one of those linear processes. They tend to work better if you slow them down and you make them in a, in a very linear set of steps. First, we're going to do this. And then when that's done, next we're going to do the second thing. Third, we're going to do the third step and then move people through that sort of sequence in the linear process. But to do that, you got to slow it down and be a bit more, uh, I don't know, more deliberate about it. I imagine that so much of this, that's online meetings, you know, create some of these issues, but so much of this is also applicable to an offline meeting or an in-person meeting. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the differences in setting expectations between an offline meeting and an online meeting and what some of your favorite tips are there. When you do an online meeting, you're buying a lot of advantages. They're quick, they're easy. If you think about travel costs, they're inexpensive. So you're, you're bringing a lot of good to the table when you set up an online meeting, but the meeting sponsor needs to know that there's a cost involved and that cost is, is efficiency. So, it's pretty intuitive and easy to use paper in a face-to-face -face meeting. You know how to have people write things down and you how to post them and you how to organize them. All of those take an inter a software interface of some sort. So the good news is that online meetings are uh, efficient in the sense that they're, they're less expensive and people from remote sites can participate without traveling and all that, that kind of thing. But you have to have tools to substitute for the activities that you can do more naturally in a face-to-face -face meeting. So the bad news is you want to get deeper into running online meetings. You're probably going to have to invest time dealing with the learning curve of getting on board with using different kinds of software and then also getting people to buy the software for you. It's just like if you were interested in becoming a carpenter or a cabinet maker, the last thing you do is show up at the job and say, here I am, put me to work. No, you'd want to invest in a whole suite of tools that are appropriate for that particular activity. Same is going to be true for people who want to be deeper into running online meetings. You're going to need fairly robust computers, going to have to have a fairly uh, vigorous uh, video card so you can usually drive multiple monitors at the same time in front of me, for example. I've got two monitors and I can juggle back and forth be between them. And then you're going to gear up with software. There's a good array of software out there now to, to support online meetings and surprising amount of it is free, or at least functional copies of it are free. Hopefully we'll have a chance to demonstrate uh, at least one piece of software that I have I have uh, high regards for. But the reality is you're going to have to invest money in it. And typically it's going to be three to $500 a shot to buy the different kinds of packages, packages that are appropriate for running different kinds of um, activities in an online meetings. And talk just a little bit about what you mean more specifically by slowing the process down. Because at one side you're saying that you know, this is really a way to condense things, but at the same time, you want to slow it down. Be a little more specific about that, would you? You, you bet. So uh, there's preventions and interventions that you're probably going to want to want to think about. And the preventions are, are um, essentially teaching the audience about uh, their side of the expectations curve. You're going to probably want to tell people, we're going to take this in a slow, steady, stepwise, business-like manner. And then when you get into an activity, say it's just a simple activity like brainstorming, what you're going to want to do is say, well, we're going to go into a brainstorming activity on whatever topic that might be. For us in this particular meeting, meaning the online meeting, we're going to take that in three steps. First is we're going to have just an open discussion of what the question is that we're trying to brainstorm around. The second is, I'm going to show you how to do that online, so there'll be a bit of a learning moment here about how you can learn to use the software. And then the third is, I'm going to turn you loose to use the software, 
and compile the brainstorming results onto the screen as we all build it out together. And I probably should have said there's a four step too. Then after that, we'll have a discussion of what the meaning of the material is. So you take the people through those, you tell them what, what you're going to do, and then you take them through them step by step. First, let's have our discussion of the question. Now let's, let me show you how to use the software. You have four or five minutes on that. Now let's, you go to work and do that. So a few minutes of that, you just take people and you name each of those steps and take them through there one at a time. And that's definitely slowing the process down. It makes a ton of sense. And I think it's something that's easy to forget. We all want to do this so quickly and have these yeah. meetings over. And a big piece of it is, is kind of setting our own expectations for ourselves about what we're planning on and making sure that it's clear to the people that we're presenting to. Let's talk a little bit more about active facilitation of a meeting. Let's, you have a four-step model. Let's talk about that. There's not a ton of heavy weather here. It's actually turned out to be simpler than I thought. When I got on this idea, it resonated with me. And when I started exposing people in my workshops to this, it sort of resonated with them. I want to convey a, a sense of optimism and reframe that there's some fairly intuitively successful ways to manage this attention process that we have and getting people to focus and, and deliver in these meetings. There's a lot to do. I don't want to downplay the fact that you got to learn software and all that sort of thing. But in terms of just the, the organizational model of grabbing people's attention and hanging on to it, it doesn't look like it's overly complex. There's no perfect model, but there's a four-step model that's a good way to think about how to begin with this. And the first step is you're going to sequence this, the meeting steps in a very carefully programmed kind of way. As I mentioned in my example a moment ago, you're not going to just say, well, let's have a brainstorm on topic X. You're going to say, no, we're going to have a brainstorm on topic X. And here are the four steps we're going to use to make that happen. And then you just, you know, as I said, take people through this. So you're going to sequence the steps uh, carefully, which means that you as the organizer of the meeting need to do a fair amount of thinking and planning about what those steps should be. You're never going to lose your situational awareness and stay on top of the events that are occurring in the meeting and adjust if, if things don't go the way you, you planned. But more than in a face-to-face -face meeting, you want to have those steps programmed out so you take people through them in, in, like I said, a linear sort of fashion. The next is you want to ask great questions. Working with people who are new to facilitation, they tend to give a little too light a weight to what is the question that I'm asking my group to address. And so a really common way they think about articulating that is, well, folks, we are here to discuss, and then they'll name the topic. And that is okay if you don't know what the topic is. So that can be a good entry point, but it's uh, necessary, but an insufficient way to proceed. What you need to do, in, especially in the online environment, to make yourself more effective is specify in as much clarity and specific detail as you can what question the group is supposed to answer. And so let me let me do a game with everybody that's online here to, to show you what the power of questioning can be because our brains are biologically hardwired to follow the leadership of a question that's been asked. So let's play a little game for a moment and see what that looks like. So everybody that's online for a moment, I want you just to take a breath and pause and now think about What's the color of your house? Could anybody not think about that? Or did you go on and think about other things like, wow, my house needs to be repainted, or I wonder what color I'll need to, I want to paint it in the next time, the next time I, I need to repaint my house. There's just tremendous, perennially intriguing fact that when you ask a question, the people receiving that question, their brains automatically want to answer it. So the second a great step in a four-step model is to, in fact, ask those great questions. And then three kinds of those questions are really serviceable across many, many environments. I'm sure we could get way deep into this and, and geek out on how to ask questions in meetings. But if you just put in your own mind that there's three broad questions that are perennially useful in these meetings, you're uh, going to be a long ways down, down the road. First are what questions. And these are usually exploratory questions. What happened? What might happen? They're retrospective analysis questions, and they tend to be prospective or future-oriented prediction kinds of questions. If that's what you need to say a prediction of what might happen in the future, make sure you articulate a tight question around that. The second category of questions are why questions. Folks who meet are often charged with the challenge of doing some kind of analysis of how they got into the particular situation they're in. Why questions are those exploratory questions that are meant to parse out and and dig into 
why a series of events happened so that you can try to figure out how to do something about it. So the second big category of questions are why something happened. And then the third category are the how questions. People meet to accomplish things. And so these how questions are really about how they're going to respond. It's how will we deal with this? How will we respond if? So there's a lot of if then contingency thinking that can emerge there. So that's the third broad category. So if you live in the arena of just these three questions, you'll be just a long ways down the road in figuring out how to um, implement a four-step model that, that's serviceable. The third step is you want to cause people at the other end of the internet line to act or move in some way. Get them to do that. And it doesn't have to be anything hugely overt or, or elegant. It's just really getting people to reach from in front of where their hands are in their lap or on their coffee cup and put it on their keyboard and type something or put it on their mouse and click something. You want people to engage, well, have them engage. And it can be totally simple, like everybody grab your mouse and click on the two items that you think are most important in the list of 20 that we just developed. Something like that can be really effective in grabbing people's attention and, and holding it. And then the fourth step, because uh, meetings are supposed to be productive, is you create some kind of commitment forming activity. This is just good management practice for any meeting. You're going to close out the meeting with a next steps or who's going to do what kinds of discussions. Make sure you close that loop. The last thing you want to do is get to the end of the meeting and have it just be a soft close without any leaning forward into those commitments. You don't want the participants sitting back like this and saying, mm -hmm, okay, I think I understand. You want them leaning forward and maybe have a sign-up sheet or something where people put their name behind different activities. You want them to lean forward into two kinds of commitment. One is, what is it you're going to do? So we've committed that uh, we're going to do this analysis or we're going to compile this data or we're going to form a task team or whatever that might be. So that's a, an emotional, intellectual, peer-to-peer -peer contractual commitment. And then the second kind of commitment is I'm willing to contribute. And so you get them leaning into their keyboards or their mouses and then making uh, self-guided, usually self-guided assignments that they're willing to follow through and do things for you. So I think there's not a ton of heavy weather here. It's a reasonably straightforward model. Do these four steps and you're going to up the engagement quite a bit. The thing that strikes me about this is that it's so easy to walk into these meetings without having a solid plan, without an intention to engage the, the audience. And just having these little things can make a huge difference in terms of how far people are leaning in. Isn't that a, a fair statement, sir? It's definitely a fair statement. <laughs> Let's do a demo of how one of these things might work. So I had a, I had a person in one of my face-to-face -face workshops one time who was struggling with online meetings, and she walked up to me in a sidebar conversation and said, you know, I'm really good with a flip chart. I just wish there was some way to put a flip chart into my computer so I could, could use it. And as it turns out, there is. Let me share with you my screen for um, my favorite piece of software. If you don't do anything else from this webinar but um, investigate and potentially buy a piece of mind mapping software, then you'll be sort of miles ahead. Okay, so everybody, here's what we're going to do. We're going to plan a picnic, and Chris and I will just springboard off of this. If this were a, a real meeting, all of you would be live in some way, and, and you'd be participating. Chris, what kind of planning activity would go into the first step of planning a picnic? I'd want to look at um, how I'm going to get everybody there and make sure that they know what to expect at the picnic. Okay, so everybody, this is a picture of the mind mapping software. I've already put the name of our meeting here, our meeting product, which is a picnic planning decision. I'm going to hit the insert button, and we're going to get a subtopic off of that that is recruitment. And so the next thing we might want to do, and I'll add this one, is another subtopic. And I'm curious about the menu. What might be another thing, Chris, that we'd do to make a picnic work? What kind of, who's going to bring what food? That would be a subtopic here. So we'll put it here, assignments. I think you get the idea. This could be venue. And this could be activities of some sort. That's where I was going. So you fill out this sort of picture, this mind mapping picture of what is going to go into a picnic. And the last thing I want to demo is that these mind mapping softwares are now so powerful that you can do some really cool things. For example, if there was more detail that was needed here about recruitment of audience, 
all the sophisticated and most of the mid-level mind manager programs allow you to add notes to each of these these nodes. These little bits of sub information are called nodes. So just for clarity, um, I'll put note one here to for this recruitment. And just to demonstrate it, we're going to go down to menu, and I'm going to add a new note there, and we'll call that note. Two. Again, these are just made up and contrived. Now, what I want you to do is watch this right box as I click back to recruitment. This note will change. Now we're going to go back to menu and we should see note two again. So here's the power and the reason I wanted to demonstrate this to you. This is literally like stuffing a flip chart into your online meeting because you can collect information about the activity that your meeting is about. You can array it in a logical order in some ways because all these nodes are movable and you can combine them and you can do a variety of other things. And then if you need more detail, you can just simply add these notes and expand it out as much, much as you want. And then all the good programs have these uh, results being exportable. And this one even has a spell checker. So that's a demonstration of what mind mapping software looks like. And just an example of the tools are gonna carry you forward for success in a lot of these online meetings where in, an, in a face-to-face -face meeting, you can have uh, activities to put people through like displaying paper on the wall and so forth. The substitute here is being conversant and having a good suite of tools. If you're a carpenter, you need carpenter tools. If you're an online meeting manager, you need those kind of tools. Now, Chris, I'm mindful of the time here. I'm wondering if it wouldn't be appropriate to talk about what folks can get next from us here. Yep. I concur. We're going to, we'll just wrap up this part by saying there is so much out there in terms of being able to engage your audience in a way that they feel like they're a part of the process and not just an observer. Um, and those tools are everywhere. And so, yeah, so let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, your website and your book, how to get it. And, uh, what they can find on your website. Okay. Go. So what I've done is I set up um, some free resources for you on a Google Drive, and you can just go download them and use them. There's a, a tip sheet about how to keep people engaged. Uh, there's a material about how to think about devising agenda that's good for an online meeting. Uh, there's uh, links to other kinds of resources like the tool, mind mapping software, getting started with mind mapping, that kind of thing. What I want to do is also encourage you to plug into the, the new website, masteringonlinemeetings.com. Feel free to plug in there and ask me any questions. I'll follow up. There's other resources there. We're going to be building out those resources as time goes forward. So we'll have uh, an array of material that, that you can use. Uh, there's even a YouTube channel that's just getting started, but I'm going to start posting how-to videos. I'm going to be here trying to be in the support mode for you and providing a variety of resources that we all can use because the reality is we're all going to learn together on how to make our online meetings work. And then lastly, if the book does have an interest to you, it's available on Amazon now. So just uh, click on over to Amazon and search up uh, Mastering Online Meetings and you'll get uh, the splash page. So to close, let me, uh, thanks for your interest in making online meetings work. As those of you who are on the call that know me personally, I've devoted the last 20 or so years of of my life trying to figure out how to get people to collaborate and cooperate better. Goodness knows we waste a lot of precious time in meetings that just don't seem to work. So it seems like a good investment. If we can make those meetings work better, I can help you be more productive. And so reach out anytime. I'm, I'm here to, to try to be helpful and make you effective in, in whatever arena you're working in. Chris, can I give the last word to you? Absolutely. Mike Freidenberg, author of Mastering Online Meetings. You can be found at masteringonlinemeetings.com and also the cooperation company. Look for Michael's book on amazon.com, search for Mastering Online Meetings, and there you will find it. The last word I have from this is in the work that Mike and I have done to get ready for this and some previous stuff, the bottom line is if you're giving a meeting and you're doing it the way that Mike is re recommending, you're going to be so highly appreciated <laughs> and viewed as a leader because, oh my God, I can go to a meeting and enjoy it and feel like I had a skin in the game and I was a part of the process. So Mike, thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.